When it comes to ancient Rome, we all know how Julius Caesar engineered the fall of Roman democracy and pushed it to become an empire. Yet we hardly know what was the most popular toy among kids in ancient Rome. We know how and why Emperor Constantine converted the Roman Empire into a Christian state, but we hardly know how much religion played a part in a common Roman person's life. Though answers to all questions won't be possible yet, history sometimes does offer us a glimpse into what day-to-day -day life was like in the forgotten past. Welcome to Nutty History. Today we are looking back at some weird traditions that were common in ancient Rome. The Ancient Roman Barbie Since its inception in 1959 to a socially acclaimed movie this year, Barbie has been a big part of Western civilization and an important global element for millions of children. Even though the word Barbie has somewhat become synonymous with feminine dolls in the modern world and it is expanding its presence in clothing lines and accessories, feminine dolls have existed for millennia. Dolls have been found in the remains of ancient Egypt, ancient Mesopotamia, and even ancient India. But the ancient Roman girls had feminine dolls that probably had the same cultural impact as Barbies do today. For ancient Romans, family roles were quite defined. While the father would work hard doing labor and the mothers would cook and take care of the rest of the chores, the role of the child was to enjoy their childhood. They would get gifts on certain occasions from their parents, which were most likely toys for their leisure time. Childhood was precious for ancient Romans because of two critical reasons. One, the high mortality rate among children, and secondly, the age of adulthood was way lower by ancient Roman standards. So either by death or marriage, a girl's childhood was not meant to last long. There was, in fact, a particular ritual to properly say farewell to their childhood. They were meant to put their toys and other playthings away on the eve of their wedding as an official step into adulthood. However, if a kid passed away young, then they would be buried with their toys so they would have their playthings in the afterlife. Thanks to that very tradition, we found out about the ancient Roman Barbie. During the construction of the Italian Ministry of Justice and a bridge across the Tiberius River, the digging revealed the burial of five sarcophagi in 1889. These sarcophagi apparently belonged to a wealthy family as each of them was filled with riches such as gold earrings, rings, bracelets, etc. But one of these sarcophagi belonged to the remains of a young woman named Creperea Trifina, whose name was mentioned in the inscription on her sarcophagus, an interesting artifact. Unlike the riches Creperea had in her sarcophagus similar to the other sarcophagi, she also had an ivory figure made with pieces that could be bent at joints. This doll appeared to be feminine in shape and about 9 inches tall. Ivory was expensive back in Roman times, and that means that Creperea definitely belonged to a noble family and must have been showered with the best possible gifts. The doll had its head and body crafted with the same piece of ivory, but separate pieces were used for the limbs. The hands and feet were also separate sections connected to the limbs with a nail and some room to wiggle. The doll was so well made that the hands opened at the elbows and the feet at the knees. The physiological details of the construction were so impressive that the doll manufacturing appeared to be way ahead of its time. The doll even fashioned a tiny gold ring on one of its hand digits and had a small ivory box accompanying it, which had more jewelry, miniature clothes, and accessories to play dress up with the doll, similar to how Barbie comes with all sorts of add-ons today. The one thing that differentiated this ancient Barbie from modern Barbie was its feminine figure. While modern Barbies tend to be slim and promote zero figure, the ancient Roman doll had wide, childbearing hips and a rounded stomach. These features on a woman were considered signs of her being fertile in the ancient Roman society. As childbearing was considered the most important function of women in ancient Rome, clearly these dolls were sort of promoting a standard body shape for women. The idea of bearing as many children as possible was instilled in the girls from a very young age back then. They love their cosmetics. Humanity has been through hundreds and thousands of years, yet some of our habits have survived for millennia, if not for the entirety of our existence. The routine of getting ready for the day in the morning is a ritual that echoes through several periods and cultures and has only evolved with time. In the past and present, for many women, the ritual of getting ready involves putting on makeup, doing complex hairstyles, and women know the struggle. But in ancient Rome, keeping up appearances was a controversial mission. For wealthy Romans, it was important to keep Venus, the goddess of beauty, on speed dial. In staunch patriarchal ancient Roman society, having a beautiful wife was considered a social status for wealthy men. 
So there was a lot of pressure on ancient Roman women to maintain a certain appearance for the sake of their husband's dignity, even if the cost of such an appearance was quite extreme. The ancient Roman cosmetic industry was all about the mantra, no pain, no gain. And yet it was a thriving industry because of peer pressure. There were three types of bathing, caldarium for hot baths, tepidarium for tepid baths, and frigidarium for cold baths. Then came pruning and then the makeup. Wealthy women would buy expensive mirrors and makeup palettes to match. They were available in wooden, bone, or gold boxes. Though some recipes were harmless and used ingredients that had been time-tested because we still use them, you know, like rose petals and honey, other recipes required ingredients that would make you scrunch your nose and raise your eyebrows. For example, the recommended treatment for spots in ancient Rome was a recipe involving chicken fat and onions. Ground oyster shells, animal urine, bile, and sulfur were used as an exfoliant and a mixture of crushed earthworms and oil was thought to camouflage gray hairs. Face cream was a mixture of animal fat and tin. No mascara? No problem. Burnt cork was the lash thickener. Roman women liked their lashes long, thick, and curly as a sign of beauty brought from Egypt and India. But one of the most important cosmetic products that added another layer of charm to a woman's beauty was rouge. And if you were living in ancient Rome, you may not be very enthusiastic about their solution for this particular product. According to ancient Roman writers, the secret behind the lovely blush on ancient Roman women's cheeks was crocodile dung. They would probably mix the dung with other aromatic ingredients to hide the stink of excrement. Also, lead was quite popular to make the skin look extra white, and that trend continued until Victorian times, despite how detrimental lead poisoning can be to human skin. Such bizarre practices were forced upon ancient Roman women because of the pressure from society. It also drew a lot of flack from satirists and poets regarding the length they would go to look pretty. The Roman poet Ovid made fun of a woman who ended up losing her hair because of using a harmful dye. Quoting here, I told you to stop using rinses, now just look at you. No hair worth mentioning left to dye. Unfortunately, no historian has yet to find any female opinions about what they actually thought about cosmetics back in the day. The Bad Streets of Rome Ancient Rome was a carefully planned city with over a million people living there. It had gleaming white marble temples and palaces. It had a public square called the Forum, where Romans shopped, conducted business, played games, and visited with friends. But that was the side ancient Romans would like history to remember. But there was a darker, dirtier side of Rome too, with a maze of side streets and slums. Stepping there was dangerous, especially at night, when things would get darker. Juvenal conjured up a nasty picture of daily life in Rome around AD 100. After dark, ancient Rome was a threatening place. Most rich people would only go out at night with their private security team of bonded labor on their long escort of attendants. The only public protection one could hope for was the paramilitary force of the night watch, the vigils. However, the main job of vigils wasn't to stop crime but to look out for fires breaking out, which was a common occurrence in the jerry-built tenement blocks where large braziers burnt on the top floors so they were more like firefighters and cops. Even their gear consisted of a small supply of vinegar and a few blankets. People were advised to avoid Rome's suburb. It was a rough neighborhood with filthy streets, cheap taverns, and houses of the dirty deed. While the Emporium was an unsavory warehouse district, Trastevere was a crowded working class district, and the Vatican was a patchwork of clay pit cemeteries and vineyards. The areas around the houses for the dirty deed were popular places for thugs and muggers, and it was over there that somebody probably would get robbed. Women's education was tolerable. Unlike ancient Egypt, which was closer to being an egalitarian society, Rome didn't consider women equal to men in any way, and that reflected in the education available for the two genders as well. Roman girls from the upper middle classes would be taught to read and write, but this would be done at home by their parents, or if the family was wealthy enough, with the help of a private tutor. Not a lot of writings by ancient Roman women have survived the time. A few specimens that still exist are mostly letters written by soldiers' wives that were discovered at the Roman fort of Vindolanda on Hadrian's Wall. These letters draw a picture of the busy social scene of life on the frontier. Also, historians are aware that Nero's mother, Agrippina the Younger, wrote a memoir, but sadly it's lost to the sands of time. There was a silver lining about not attending school, as it avoided them getting beatings with a cane for disobeying, giving wrong answers, or failing to meet the expectations of the school staff in any way. Ancient Romans still believed that education to an extent was not a waste on women. A degree of learning was considered useful for girls to be better at running a household after marriage, and it also helped them to be better at being social. 
because they could hold their ground in conversations. But at the same time, a well-learned woman was considered unattractive by ancient Roman standards, which is a hypocritical way of saying that they were scared of a woman who knew better than them. Let's just keep it a hundred. Yet, some elite families that had an exemplary academic track record did have a progressive mind back then, and, though in secret sometimes, did encourage their daughters to develop an unusually educated persona. Of course, this form of education was also achieved with the help of a private tutor. Hortensia was the daughter of Cicero's great courtroom rival Hortensius and was celebrated for her speech-making skills. Very few women were allowed to make speeches among men back then. In 42 BC, Hortensia stood on the speaker's platform in the Roman Forum and eloquently denounced the imposition of a tax imposed on Rome's wealthiest women to help pay for the war. They fed the children. What? Serratus of Ephesus was a Greek physician who practiced mostly in Alexandria and subsequently in Rome. He was one of the chief representatives of the Methodic School of Medicine, who also was an influential author in the field of gynecology during the second century. Now, according to his opinion, mothers should let wet nurses feed infants for days after birth. He based that opinion on the grounds that the mother couldn't be too tired to nurse her own baby. He was very much against the idea of feeding the baby on demand, and he also recommended that solids such as bread soaked in wine should be introduced at the age of six months. Now that would explain a lot. Modern doctors might not agree with such a hot take on breastfeeding in the diet of a baby, but wealthy women of ancient Rome did. In fact, it was of general belief that most mothers from wealthy backgrounds hated feeding their own children, and usually hired a free woman or used their bonded labors to take care of their baby's hunger. Most Roman physicians and philosophers also didn't agree with Serranus' prescription. Most ancient Roman physicians thought that mother's milk was best for both the child's health and building their moral character. They believed that wet nurses might pass on several defects of character to the baby, which is a hot take itself. Divorce equals child-free in ancient Rome, marriage was the engine that kept the system running. It was the grease and glue of the social machine, and in such a mechanical structure, there was no need for love. Marriages facilitated political, commercial, and personal ties between families, and once that benefit was exhausted, marital ties couldn't be severed at short notice by either of the parties. Unlike the modern divorce procedure, which requires a lot of legal paperwork, divorces in ancient Rome were pretty quick with no need to involve the legal system. All it needed to end things was for one of the spouses to say, I'm done. Not very different from the idea of the modern breakup. The only person outside of a couple who could initiate divorce was the wife's father, as in ancient Rome, daughters were considered the property of their fathers, even after the marriage. Such an arrangement allowed the wife's family to reclaim any dowry paid to the husband, thus keeping the assets of the family intact. However, there was an exception to this arrangement. If the wife was involved in adultery, then the husband could be exempted from paying the dowry back as compensation for emotional and social harm caused by the wife. So a lot of husbands would try to malign the image of their wives due to greed, making the divorce a proper mess. And finally, there was the issue of the custody of the children. This was one matter that could actually prevent women from going through a divorce as the Roman legal system favored the father rather than the mother in the event of a divorce. Just like the father of the wife could initiate the divorce because they had legal guardianship over their daughter, the same logic applied to kids of broken marriages too. They belong to their father. Ironically, despite childbearing being the most important duty of an ancient Roman woman, they had no legal claim over the children they gave birth to. The legal system was all in favor of the patrilineal relationship. Of course, such a system was heartbreaking. The only exception to this rule was if the father would allow kids to live with their mother after the split. But there were also cases where kids would never get to see their mother again. Rome's first emperor, Augustus, divorced Scribonia for political gain when their daughter, Julia, was still an infant. Julia would not get to see her mother until she was grown up. Julia almost tried to usurp Augustus after having open affairs with multiple men and therefore got banished to the island of Ventotene. Scribonia then voluntarily moved to the island so she could rekindle her relationship with the daughter she hadn't met in decades. If you'd like to watch the rise and fall of Julia, the rebellious daughter of Augustus, go check out the video on her life on our channel. Tell us in the comments, what else would you like us to cover? Thanks for watching Nutty History, and please do share, like, and subscribe for more videos like this.